In this episode of Shit They Won't Tell You in Sex Ed, I sit down with Zeke Thomas and talk about his experience with having been sexually assaulted and raped. We talk about how he moved past the trauma, what his sex life is like now, and get some of his views on what's going on in the world in terms of sexual abuse and the media. We talk about Judge Kavanaugh, Dr. Ford, Michael Jackson, and Jesse Smollett. Hi, I'm Thomas, and I'm a sex researcher. Hi, I'm Zeke Thomas, and I am a DJ, artist, and activist. When you hear the term sexual assault and rape, you probably think of a man being the perpetrator and a woman as the victim. But research from the CDC has shown that as many as one in six men have been sexually abused or assaulted in their lifetime. Take a moment and think about that. Name six men you know and then realize that chances are that this has happened to at least one of them. Zeke Thomas is a DJ, singer, and even co-hosted an episode of MTV's Catfish. But he's also a survivor of sexual assault and rape, and now an advocate. And I've invited him here today to share his story with us in hopes that it will help others who have been affected by sexual violence. Zeke first became a victim of sexual assault at the age of 12, and then again just a couple years ago. And we're not going to talk about that today because, well, he's talked about it a ton of other times. So I am going to put those links above if you would like some of those details. But today we're really going to focus on how you deal with trauma and how you move past it. So Zeke, in a different interview that I watched, you talked a little bit about before you started telling people about what happened to you. And one of the things that you mentioned was substance use, which is something that's often reported for people that have been victims or have trauma of some sort. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that. Um, I actually disclosed high on mushrooms in the back of a cab. So my substance use, you know, I, I did all the party drugs. I was, I was very much immersed in the party culture. And I didn't, it was actually very weird for me because a lot of my friends, before I was doing a lot of substance abuse, they didn't understand what was going on in my life. And they actually said to me, we didn't know what was going on with you. We just knew that something was wrong, but didn't know how to approach you. So what was weird for me and hard for me was here's this community of people who is embracing me and we're coping and dealing with things together. We both know and are aware that we shouldn't be doing these drugs or these drugs are causing us detriment, even addiction, even definitely abuse. Um, but I definitely was coping and still am coping with demons that definitely were wanting to be subdued and muted. And at the time when I was first beginning, it was like I wasn't on medication. I wasn't in therapy. I was definitely just self-medicating and talking with friends and, you know, just around other people again we're going through a lot of things and generally you don't pick up hard drugs just out of the blue you generally pick up something because you're dealing with something so you were going through a ton of stuff and it sounds like you hadn't disclosed to anyone and then had started like using more substances maybe than before and that that was really just a way that you were sort of suppressing what it was that you were feeling and trying to avoid those emotions Definitely. And even it was, you know, I, I even felt that I couldn't be myself or wanted to be a specific version of myself mm -hmm. differently. I didn't want to be, I guess, the Zeke that, you know, everybody, I'm very extroverted, I'm very exuberant, but with substances, I become very introverted. I'm just here, there not wanting to, you know, exert myself. I've definitely, you know, grown and now just all in aspects of my life. I'm, I'm so much more honest now mm -hmm. than I've ever been in life. And I think that generally just has to deal with, you know, me going through trauma, me dealing with, dealing with shit. And even, you know, rape definitely triggered a lot and definitely was hard to get over, but all the underlying things that I had to let go for years, those were the things that were really just coming up and coming up and coming up. That those were the things that I was trying to push down because I had pushed them down for years. Why would I want to bring them up again, you know? 
In a lot of the therapy work that I do, we pay special attention to identities and to roles that people have in society. So yourself being a black man that identifies as gay, I'm wondering how you think that your experience after trauma may be different than someone who is white or straight or female. I think um, the number one experience that I've had and had to think about is just from being black, identifying black, automatically the criminal justice system gives you a distrust. So when people always say, why didn't you report? I didn't want to report because I knew that there would automatically be a pushback, a distrust in my mind. In my mind, just, you know, you know, black people are discriminated against by the criminal justice system. So then to put the layer on top of it that I was raped by a man and having the stigma around that just people are just mind blown that it that happened or that's happening or a man can be raped. Um, that was something that was just scary. So then on top of it, it's gay. So going into a police station and saying to the heteronormative white gay or white cop who's sitting there taking your statement or talking with you, not that they don't empathize with you or care or whatever, it's an intimidating factor when you're just picturing a white, you know, working class cop now taking the experience of a gay man whether they have ever even been in a gay bar, whether they even have a gay friend. People generally hang out with people who are in their community. So if you live in a white working class community who has no minorities, that's your life, that's your experience. And your only outset to that world is through the media or a television show. And no, Empire is not <laughs> the basis of black culture. And I'm not Jesse Smollett for the record. <laughs> oh, God. But it's just like that was difficult to wrap my mind around. I'm curious with sort of everything that's going on now in in the country and the country seeming so divided and sexual assault and rape somehow being something that the country is divided on. Mm -hmm. um, what, what is that like for you to see things like the um, Kavanaugh hearings? It was so interesting because, for my experience, because actually during the Kavanaugh hearings, I was in Detroit receiving an award for my activism and for being outspoken. I received a Youth Impact Award. Myself, Billy Porter, Margaret Cho, We've all, you know, talked about these things and tried to help the youth in these mm -hmm. movements. So I'm sitting there, and Margaret Cho actually was making jokes about it, but it's really kind of just internalizing, like, wow, people really have different opinions on this hard issue, like mm -hmm. you just said, like, vastly different opinions. But the hard thing is, and it wasn't that, you know, his law record is whatever it was where we were wondering what kind of person are you and clearly it showed this guy isn't the right person to be on the bench it is screaming it, and it yelling had, yeah, yeah. It, had, it had no it had nothing to do with yes trump or whomever was going to appoint a conservative judge mm -hmm. a judge who was going to think in the anton scalia way or vote whatever sure. but it was like why this guy mm -hmm. <laughs> you know why this guy who clearly is expressing a view and drumming up this hate of oppression it really was oppression for women you know not just you know not just sexual assault victims in general it was like women are being targeted and it was so interesting that it was just happened to be a white woman i mean with anita hill was a black woman but this right. is a white woman accredited professor who literally is laying out for you, has no reason to lie about this, yeah. and has documented that this moment affected her life. You know what I mean? It wasn't like, you know, just... Yeah, in multiple ways she had her therapist behind her. It was her just up. so breathtaking, and that's why I feel like so many victims are like, if they don't believe her... Why would they ever, why believe, would they ever believe me? That was hard. 
you know, when I'm going on stage saying, you know, women are strong, kids are strong, survivors, you know, support survivors. If the victim can't even get heard by not even the law of the criminal justice system, but just general people in general, yeah. like, you know, the neighborhood people, you go to the bodega and that person's like, you're a fucking liar. That's hard. Have you ever had anyone tell you that they think you're a liar? I've never had anybody tell me I'm a liar, but I've had people say, well, you were a guy. It wasn't that bad for you. Well, you know, get over it. Well, mm -hmm. you know, shit. <laughs> so people will belittle your experience just because it wasn't their experience. So they might not say, I don't believe you or it didn't happen, but they might say, you, you must have liked it or oh. it couldn't have been that bad for you. You know, I have people say, was he hot? <laughs> you know, like, right. Like even, you know, when I was 12 years old, which just in fact of people, you know, talking about, you know, me when I was 12 years old is fucking weird. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it was actually, you know, it was pretty much a gang rape. Like I was forced, you know, suck a bunch of guys on my basketball team, but that wasn't, you know, okay right. or hot. <laughs> Along with therapy, another way that you've been able to help move past some of your trauma is through your art, specifically through expression, through music. How has that been helpful? You know, my music is definitely my first love, and DJing has become, you know, everything to me. If I could DJ every single day, I would, in an instance, find me for buttons. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's, it, it's been therapeutic, and... The reason why it's been therapeutic is the actual songs of themselves. Yes, I write music, I produce music, but generally listening to other people's songs, like I love Michael Jackson. Like Michael Jackson is favorite artist, Stevie Wonder, you know, Diana Ross. I'm naming all these old people, which is making me sound really dated. <laughs> <laughs> but I love it. And I love, you know, just having music around. You know, I've started painting. I've, you know, got back into acting. Um, I feel that, you know, expression of my creative self was definitely being stifled by the trauma I was going through. So because you brought up Michael Jackson, I do have to ask, because there is now another, another division of people that will support him, people that won't support him due to the Finding Neverland documentary. So I'm curious. So I am biased only because I, I am a friend of the Jackson family and I actually, and then on a bigger stage, I truly believe Michael Jackson is the greatest humanitarian of our time. He's done more for children than any artist, any politician in terms of the financial backing. Not to say that he couldn't have done some horrible things. Every person is flawed. Do I believe the people in the Finding Neverland documentary as people? No, I don't. And that's my own opinion. That's not to say you should not believe survivors. That's not to say you shouldn't believe, you know, victims and people of sexual assault. But looking at the facts that were laid out just in terms of the timeline, in terms of you know, testifying under court, you know, yes, he testified when he was young, and he also testified when he was like 21 years old. So there's just certain things that just were red flags to me, even him, you know, dating, you know, one of the one of Michael's cousins. And we can relitigate, you know, that whole thing ever. But the most important thing that I'm seeing people do is all these mute moments and get rid of people and mm. that to me is astonite yes r kelly is a sick person for what he did maybe he'll get found not innocent maybe he didn't do it you know we, we're so quick now to just crucify people you know we do have a justice system that we should let play out he's a sick person but <laughs> yeah there's so many artists that in the past, you know, you can list Elvis, you can talk about Leonardo da Vinci, you can, you know, are we going to just blow up the 16th Chapel? Mm -hmm. Like, there are people who did things that were 
acceptable back then or not acceptable back then, but they did them. And you have to separate the art from the artist because every person is flawed. Mm -hmm. We all believe Jesse Smollett. You know, Jesse Smollett was huge. And I think that he still is going, I think he's going through trauma. I don't think it had anything to do with, you know, I want to raise, you know, what, what you're, you're going to get like $10,000 more? Is that really going to make that much of a difference in your life? I think it had something to do with whatever it did. And he made a calculated bet to do something and it completely failed for him. <laughs> and I think that, you know, we have to remember people lie. They do. And... People tell the truth. They do. And sometimes people get away with lies. And sometimes the people telling the truth, you know, is not the whole truth. I mean, there's so much greater. So we can't just sit here and say red and blue. Obviously, people use apps for a lot of different things, especially in the gay community. I would guess that the majority of people that meet on apps are not looking for dates. Um, <laughs> they are looking to hook up. Um, that's sort of just the reality. They want to love, Thomas. No, they the do. The day they want love. I, I <laughs> agree. Haven't you ever got googly eyed in the club and you have that moment and you think you found the one? <laughs> Every time I go to a club. Uh, yeah, absolutely. But people are not always looking for love at that the time. moment. <laughs> um, oh, that's happened to me too. I mean, the people on the and profile. Like, oh, oh, and they're like, dude, it's not that serious. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the people on their profile where it says looking for now are probably looking not for looking now. for love. And they're actually probably not looking for now. They're looking for like eight hours later when you're not available. And. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not did, did I have a nerve? I'm not speaking a nerve? from personal experience at all. No, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> um, so for for someone that is that's doing something more like that, where it's really not like date oriented or relationship oriented, what are are there any tips that you might throw out for those people? I mean, we live in New York City. People are just the reality of it is like yeah. people are doing it a lot. I mean. I, Especially when you when you reference New York City, I mean, it's it, and group sex has become very popular and taboo. I mean, there's basically advertised sex rooms at clubs, right. parties, and whatever. And I think there's a certain security to that, almost. I mean, if somebody is a predator or taking advantage of somebody, I've seen people generally like, what the hell are you doing? Or... Whatever. Now that's not saying I, I think everybody wants to have an orgy in their apartment every right. night <laughs> to protect themselves. But I think that, you know, there are even times where you, you know, you FaceTime a person, you have a conversation with a person, you try to have an Instagram with a person, if you're Insta look at their Instagram. There are ways to kind of get the pulse of a person per se before you just give them their address and let them in your house. Right. Or if you go to their house, you know, there are there are safety guards. I mean, you're not still going to know that person. They could obviously be presenting a fake person um, or, you know, not fully representing themselves. So that kind of leads me to the next thing I'm curious about. What is your sex life like now? Well, generally post-rape, I was very, like, closed off. And... Yeah, I went to orgies, I went to sex parties, I went to sex clubs, and I would generally just watch. For a while, I couldn't even get an erection. Like, I was so just dehumanized, de-whatever, but I wanted to be around. I, I, I thought that, you know, a hot guy could turn me on, or this could turn me on, or whatever, or this drug could get me off, or whatever. And I started to make sex less of a priority. And I think that was actually the cool thing for me now living in my life that it's become less of a priority because I more so just put myself first and my needs. Now that might be not be everyone's needs. Some people might need to have sex a while. I remember I used to want to have sex all the fucking time. But that's just not my priority. Maybe that's getting older, maybe that's whatever. But I was genuinely affected and there still are times that I'm affected. I mean, 
I've dated two people. Very strongly, I would call them boyfriends. I am single now. I, but, <laughs> but, you know, when I dated them, you know, I, 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 they're probably been my least sexual relationships. And I had to go into those relationships saying, well, you know, I lied to the first one. But second one, I went into saying. But you didn't saying, tell them. I didn't tell them. The second one, though, I went into saying, hey, I was assaulted. I have become very sensitive around sex. There will be times when we're intimate. There will be times when I don't want you to touch me. And that's okay. And you're going to have to accept that. It has nothing to do with you. It is probably nothing even to do with me. It's just the way that my body now reacts to certain things. I imagine that some people in relationships post rape or post sexual assault might have a difficult time being with a new partner and telling them, I don't want you to touch me right now. Like it doesn't have anything to do with you. Just, I don't want anyone touching me right now. Um, was that, I mean, and I could also just imagine some people being like, no, I have to let them do that because mm -hmm. I'm dating them and like, I, I'm mm -hmm. supposed to like this. I'm supposed to let them and kind of yeah. pushing themselves and I'd say through it. At first, that's what I was doing. I was trying to force it, but in forcing it, I found out that that's not the way I function sexually. Yeah. Like I couldn't force the moment. Now I'm sure, you know, I could inject my dick with Trimex or take Viagra and just be whatever but right. that, that's not enjoyable that's not to be what sex supposed to be about we're all trying to discover even i mean even you generally don't you know give somebody a contract saying i like this 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 and this right. you more so have an idea right but everybody in that moment i'm sure every every person has been like move your hand there or talk right. to that or you know hopefully, what I mean? hopefully they're <laughs> able to have that communication <laughs> to let their partner know what they want or don't want mm -hmm. so have you have you been able to have a sexual encounter since then that you can say that you've really enjoyed 100 percent. i've 100 i mean it hasn't been all bad there's 100 percent been normal sex high sex whatever i have had normal healthy things happen to me um but then i also reinforce there are those moments when i just don't want you to touch me i'm not into it I'm, and i now i've gotten to a point where i'm very clear about it most victims are waiting for somebody to save them survivors are saying okay i'm taking responsibility and going to pull myself out of this hole because nobody's going to pull you out of the hole but you you can be a victim for the rest of your life. You can turn a survivor into something very, you know, not quickly. You know, the path isn't quick for everybody. Sometimes it's long, sometimes it's whatever. But the moment that you choose, I'm no longer a victim because I'm moving on with my life. I'm going to try to rebuild this life. Because basically, you know, you were just murdered in your brain. And now you're going through a heightened state of trauma. and you got to get through But there's a million steps after those two that you have to get through. I mean, even getting out of bed is a step. Going to work right. is a step. You know, there's little things that we generally don't think about. We just concentrate on therapy or whatever. But I mean, there are wins every day that people who are depressed or people who are dealing with trauma can't do. You know what I mean? Like going to the gym. Sure. For somebody who's depressed and in trauma is nearly impossible. Mm -hmm. You know, weight issues come up. It's, it's You just spiral out. And if you don't stop the spiral, eventually you end up at the worst point, which is six feet under. Okay, so I think that is it for now. Um, so thank you so much for coming on and talking about all this stuff. I know some of it is difficult to talk about, some of it not so difficult to talk about, but I think that we touched on a lot of things that people are going to find really interesting and hopefully helpful. So if you are someone who is a victim of sexual assault, sexual abuse, rape, um, know that there is help and that there are a lot of different things that you can do to get help. I'm going to put some links for you below. And why don't you tell everyone where they can find you? I'm Zeke Thomas, and you can definitely find me, DM me, talk to me. Any victims or survivors want to reach out, please do. It's Zeke, Z-E-K-E, -E underscore Thomas. And anybody wants to talk about trauma, 
or if you're cute, holla. Um, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> okay, so we will leave it there and I will see you next time. Bye. Thanks for watching. I've got a lot of content in production and I don't want you to miss out. So go ahead and click that subscribe button. And in the meantime, check out one of these other videos. And don't forget to send me your questions about sex to thomastalksabout at gmail.com. Did you hear me?